Welcome everyone to a Wednesday edition of the Damage Report, and it's Wednesday that means something. It's Big News Wednesday on the Damage Report. There's Brett Ehrlich. Which way? That way. He's actually in another place, but with the magic of television and the internet, there he is there. Brett Ehrlich, fresh off of some time to himself and wife. How are you feeling, brother? I'm feeling spectacular. What ends up happening if you take nine days off, you're like refreshed, ready to hit the ground running. Really? You take 14 days off, <laughs> you're like, oh, I never want to work another day in my life. <laughs> I woke up not thinking about how to accomplish any tasks except like finding a vending machine with coffee in it and like beer. Well, this, uh, you know, that's the way to live life, actually. I see it. And you know what? Sometimes when it's a Wednesday, you need to crack open energy drinks. It's crazy in here. This is a vacation in a can. I'm going to be, I know you guys make fun of me for this, but this is what I do every once in a while and I'm not going to stop. Sorry. What's your energy drink of choice? It's, uh, you guys never, I, I, I wonder why you did this. There's a reason why I literally showed the back of it so you couldn't see the label. It's Nas energy drink. Where's the camera? Yeah, Nas. Gamer. <laughs> Jared's a gamer. Like I fast f- and furious in an energy drink. I don't know what to, <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself he, anymore. He puts that in his <laughs> tailpipe when he's late to work. Let's do this. He just pours <laughs> it in the washer fluid and somehow it worked. I do need to say that yeah, I'm supposed to be on Friday, but there's something else I need to do Friday. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm here on a Wednesday. But when I got the email this morning from Ashley, I was like, oh, I'll pretend I remembered. Uh, but I'm glad I got the email. I'm glad I'm here with you. I'm Me glad too. I'm doing happy half hour tonight at 5 30 no. p.m. Pacific, 8 30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash TYT. And uh, I'm just stoked about this show today. What Brett realizes is that I don't uh, give people an opportunity to let them know what does they do outside of being on the show with me. So I apologize and thank you for being there as well. There's a lot to get to though. So while this energy gets pumping through my veins in a couple seconds, let's start here because you guys know this happened. We might as well talk about it. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. Chair declares the House in recess subject to the call of the chair. There's a significantly different level of slamming in these two gavels. One being the uh, the president that was presiding over the session that ousted one Kevin McCarthy from his speakership versus that guy who's the new pro temp speaker. That slam was something a little bit more to it that uh, I don't think many people were expecting. But at the end of it all, the case still remains. Kevin McCarthy is no longer speaker of the house. As a matter of fact, the first time in American history, a speaker has been ousted specifically by his own damn party. Because rules got changed, he basically handed the keys over to Matt Gates and company, and they put those keys in ignition and they drove and left Kevin McCarthy's ass behind. Let's look at the count here that happened. Though from CNN, exactly how this happened: Republicans voting to oust McCarthy as Speaker were there was eight of them. Here's all eight. They joined all Democrats, of course: Matt Gates of Florida, Eli Crane and Andy Biggs of Arizona, Ken Buck of Colorado. Tim Burchett of Tennessee, he's my favorite one that did this. Bob Good of Virginia, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, and Matt Rosendale of Montana. A few names maybe you haven't heard of, but a couple of few that you have actually have as well. And actually a few surprises in there, which again, can't wait to get to that part. But McCarthy did respond to this seemingly uh, uh, ouster, uh, this uh, mutiny from his fellow Republicans. He responded afterwards, and there were some jovial moments oddly here, but he was generally talking this way. My goals have not changed. My ability to fight is just in a different form. You need 218. Unfortunately, 4% of our conference can join all the Democrats and dictate who can be the Republican speaker in this house. I don't think that rule is good for the institution, but apparently I'm the only one. I believe I can continue to fight, maybe in a different manner. I will not run for speaker again. I'll have the conference pick somebody else. He has this cadence as if he's a statesman. And then, therefore, I shall. Why can't politicians talk normally? Just speak. But still, it's who they are. It's what it's about. He mentioned there about how Democrats joined with these eight Republicans to choose 
who's gonna be the speaker of this house? Speaking specifically how Republicans control the house, right? But therefore Democrats and eight Republicans are the ones that are deciding this. Not the Republicans brought this up, specifically a Republican that he gave the power to to do so. And in case you don't believe me, really fast, this was a graphic on the next part. But I want to read this because I think he forgot. McCarthy's ascension to becoming the Speaker of the House didn't come without a cost. You guys remember this? It came with some concessions. In addition to agreeing to disallow members from voting via proxy, limitations on spending bills, bringing back a 19th century rule allowing legislators to reduce the salaries of federal employees, McCarthy made a key concession. And he allowed any single House member to file a motion to vacate in an attempt to boot him from his seat. That one person was one Matt Gates. That deal he made was with one Matt Gates, and Matt Gates then pulled it out of his back pocket. But still, somehow, it became a Democrat's fault that Matt Gates, who has an R behind his name and screamed and yelled the entire time against other Republicans as they were going through this process, it still ended up being Democrats' fault. I think we're beginning to see why no one had Kevin McCarthy's back. Because even when he needed to grovel and go after someone that could make Maybe save his ass. It was only uh, Matt Gates who could save his ass. And Matt Gates told him from the beginning, I have no interest in you even being here. So why would I keep you here when I now have the power to run the house? Your thoughts on that first, Brett, because there's so much more. Being the Speaker of the House is a difficult job. Being the Speaker of this House is a very difficult <laughs> job. Kevin McCarthy is not good enough at this job to keep it. That is the resounding conclusion to a very short tenure. And and the stuff he's blaming is stuff he should have known and been able to uh, you know, kind of plan around. He's saying, oh, that rule that Democrats can help choose the Speaker of the House is a bad rule. Yeah, but it was the lay of the land when you took it. And that's not the rule that sunk you, idiot. The rule that sunk you was what JR just mentioned a second ago. Like that he, that he agreed to a rule that one person could bring a motion and be like, let's boot this guy out of here. And he did that because he felt he needed to be Speaker of the House so bad. And he wasn't good enough at negotiating to find a way around it. He, however, is the biggest proof you need to to understand how he's not the speak why he's a bad speaker of the house is he just needs to count votes like Nancy Pelosi everybody says she's a master legislator and a lot of people on TYT say that that's not the truth what she is a master at is counting votes she's a master at knowing how many people are with her and how many people are against her and giving out concessions so that people stay with her in a big enough number where she can avoid crap like this and McCarthy was so bad at counting votes. There's actually a second step to this that he said, I don't even need to do. Two days ago, yesterday, he was on, on Sunday, he was on Martha or whatever, the Face the Nation or Meet the Press or whatever the hell. And he said, bring it on, I'll survive this. And then part of the rule that allows one person to challenge his speakership and have him voted out is that he gets 48 hours to figure it out. And he said, I don't need it. He said, I don't think need those 48 hours. And he just went for it. And I he speculated got his, on that. He's yeah. been stressed for eight months, bro. He's been looking over his shoulder at Matt Gates, breathing. So he's like, bro, I don't know. He's like, I'm tired of it. It's like enough of the stress has built up in him. He's like, you know what? It's going to happen at some point. If I somehow concede to Matt some more and last another month, by November, December, I'm back in the hot seat. He knew this is going to be the, the, the temperature of his entire speakership. Matt Gates controlled it. I guess he trusted him. That was the only route he could go because doing anything as far as working with Democrats, the way they talk about how they say they're bipartisan and we work across the aisle, no one actually believes it because it's like toxic to even mention it. I think today was a political decision by the Democrats. And I think, I think the things they have done in the past hurt the institution. And they just started removing people from committee. And they just started doing the other things. And I, I, my fear is the institution fell today. Because you can't do the job if eight people, you have 94% of, or 96% of your entire conference, but eight people can partner with the whole other side. How do you govern? How do you govern it? I mean, the, the, you mentioned that you hear the examples that Kevin McCarthy gave there. He said that, you know, where these Democrats put, took people off committees and did other things. It's very 
Donald Trumpy in the way that he gave details of what he's so upset about the Democrats did. They took people off committees. Who did they take off committees and why did they take them off committees? Were they racist? Were they threatening folks? Were they putting out things that told their followers and supporters that they should potentially have daydreams of murdering any political opponents? Was that some of it that they were taken off of committees for because they were acting like rogue people throughout the country that want to commit violence against political enemies of theirs? Maybe that's just the reason. The one thing that you gave an example of without the context of what is that people were kicked off their committees for. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries talked to. We're going to pump through these. Let's go to Hakeem Jeffries. We encourage our Republican colleagues who claim to be more traditional to break from the extremists in the chaos, in the dysfunction, in the extremism. We are ready, willing, and able to work together with our Republican colleagues, but it is on them to join us to move the Congress and the country forward. By the way, Brett, really fast, because I said this yesterday to Dave and I mentioned it to someone else in the studio. Um, Matt Gates wanted certain things. His part of his concessions, of course, people are hearing about the control he had, but he wants different approaches to how they legislate, how they go through bills and uh, itemized things, specifically pointing out some of these things. But it was all based in more spending cuts for regular folks while giving more handouts to the rich and corporations. So that's the basis for his politics behind it. But oddly, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm willing to hear the actual reasons behind this if I am. Everything that Matt Gates has been doing towards Kevin McCarthy is everything that he said he would do based off of what he wants. Who knows if it's reality that that's what he wants. But everything he said has been exactly what we could expect. It's not like when Matt Gates did this, I went, oh my God, Matt Gates is actually looking to take out Kevin McCarthy because he didn't agree to these very specific things. Going back to pre, I don't know, just after uh, pandemic levels of spending, when they've done all these different things in a certain way for a particular reason. And because they didn't go back to that, he's ready to take him out. He said he was going to do that. You should have agreed to it in the first place. They are who we thought they were. <laughs> um, Maybe yeah. that's a principle for him. I don't know. Maybe Matt Gates is principled and he's just a bad principled person. I don't know. Matt Gates is, is not principled. Matt Gates is really good at seeming principled to people that want to see principle in Matt Gates's action. Uh, he, Matt Gates is a Nepo baby who had everything given to him in his entire life. His dad was a huge political operative in that district, Florida one. Matt Gates, despite his horrible history and childhood and things that would have gotten you kicked out if you were just some random person that would have sabotaged your entire career. Matt Gates's dad just was like, let's get rid of this DUI. Let's let he can have the Coke parties and still make it. Matt Gates is really opportunistic. And Matt Gates had the numbers. Matt, you know, Kevin McCarthy's job is to hold the caucus together. Matt Gates's job is to lift up Matt Gates and essentially shift the Overton window to this like Trumpian new world. But Look at the numbers. There's still only eight people with Matt Gates, and half of them are just like, I don't know, I didn't like the guy. Um, yeah, that's it. Kevin, so so Matt Gates did. He is who we thought we he was. We were. He, we he is who we thought he was. Fine. Um, Kevin McCarthy. That first clip you played <laughs> is proof that he should have lost his job. He should never have had that job because his argument is he is shocked, shocked that politics is political, <laughs> and he is shocked, shocked. That Democrats didn't support him. You're a Republican idiot. Like all of this is a guy who thinks he's smarter than he is, proving that he's not as smart as he thinks he is. That was the plan. I mean, look, and you mentioned Pelosi and how she held the conference together and she was leader, a speaker, and all this. Uh, both she and Kevin McCarthy, I think, partially get those positions because they raised a lot of money and get people elected. And that's part of what he was complaining about a little bit too. And someone asked him, What would you have done differently? He goes, Well, I got a lot of the people who voted against me elected. Maybe I wouldn't have given them that much money. And he was getting taunting messages about how he gave three million to one person. Thing was Nancy Mace, particularly, he was talking about. So maybe he's reflecting and seeing how this all worked out, but Reflection has never worked for these types of Republicans that find themselves standing next to Donald Trump, kissing his ring and visiting him and telling him how much they support him and love him despite all the things that he's done. But it still comes back to bite him in the ass, which I wonder what he's thinking right now. Apparently, there was something of him walking out of his office with the box under his, shoulder, under his arm because he's not been kicked out. That's just the way they are. There's one last section of this, though. 
One little, uh, I, by the way, your, your points about Matt Gates absolutely uh, uh, take, uh, uh, you know, I take those uh, the, very seriously because this is the, there's a thing about him. Um, those things are beginning to be hidden because of all the other traumatic and crazy things that are going on in the country. He's got a guy that's a bigger name than him, Donald Trump, that does more outlandish things so he can fly under the radar. Um, but again, he said from the beginning, I'm an agent of chaos. Watch me destroy. Ron DeSanctimonious. I'm frustrated by you not answering a direct question. Trump needs to take a good look in the mirror. Uh oh, it's all going down. So now the House Republicans can't really uh, legislate. And they found a way to get rid of their speaker. They're now fighting. Let's start over here on Fox News. I'm furious. First of all, we're without a speaker. This is historic. Something like this hasn't happened in well over 100 years. And now what we've got is total chaos when the Republicans are playing out their infighting on national television in a historic way instead of fighting Joe Biden's policies. The one time we are up in virtually every metric as it relates to the Biden administration, you've got the Republicans going out there and showing how dysfunctional they are. Are they dysfunctional or are they showing how dysfunctional they are? Because they're showing it, they must be dysfunctional. Why do you still support these folks that do these things? But still, there, she's upset. She's so upset that they went out showing the dysfunction. Is it that they're always dysfunctional? You just don't want us to see it? There's supposed to be some transparency when it comes to these folks. Uh, but I'm glad we're finally seeing it a little bit more now. That's nothing compared, though, apparently to Chip Roy, representative out there who's also mad about this. Let's watch that. Some of our brothers and sisters, particularly in the um, you know, uh, MAGA camp, I think, uh, particularly enjoy the circular firing squad. You want to come at me and call me a rhino? You can kiss my ass. Look, I've spent a lifetime fighting for limited government conservatism. I have laid it all on the line. I've not seen my family but for two days in the last 30 days. You go around talking your big game and you thumping your chest on Twitter. Yeah, come to my office and come have a debate, mother. You know why? Because I'm standing up for this country every single day. And Steve, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to go to a nunnery. Because God damn it, there were people who were buried over in Normandy who deserve us to stand up for what they fought for. So that's what I'm going to do. And all of you out there who are out there saying what you're saying out on social media, you stick it. Wow, there's anger there outside of the fact that the camera's right up his nose. Outside of that, he's very upset about how this is all going down because the criticism is raining down. As he mentioned, I'm no rhino, I'm just trying to stand up. They mentioned Normandy and World War II and Hitler all the time, disconnected from everything they're talking about. McCarthy did it yesterday too during his marathon post ousting press conference and how this whole Ukraine has something to do with Hitler still. If you bring it up, apparently it's supposed to be working towards your argument. One more piece, though, because I want to respond to all of it, Brett, because this is now the levels of how this infighting has turned into the supporters out in the streets or on the internet saying things to folks who don't say specifically and exactly the way they want. If you're not hardcore 100% Donald Trump MAGA, you're not one of us, and you know what that means. Let's listen to Charlie Kirk talk about it. This is so funny. Betsy says, Charlie. We see through you now. You're just like the rhinos. Quit calling yourself a conservative. You are a fake. Okay, Betsy. I'll listen to you when you've traveled 3,000 days over the last decade fighting for this country. Really, really clear and persuasive. Someone says here, who cares what come next, Charlie? Stop with your questions. The people like the former speaker who take bows for having a great record should calm down. Good for Representative Gates. Burn it all down. Okay. Honestly, burning all down sounds like Antifa. I'm just gonna be honest. I'm just I'm just curious what what is the strategy here? What is the tactic? Who's going to replace? And I know these questions bother some people. Stop asking questions. Just do it. Take off the head. Oh, okay, I, I I got that. Well, what 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 is what is the plan though? Because you need a speaker. So who's it going to be? Right. This is the one thing when it comes to infighting amongst Republicans, amongst folks that are always wrong. Is once they start fighting amongst themselves, someone ends up being right a little bit. And I'm always uncomfortable with deciding that. 
I just, the whole time Chip Roy was talking, I was like, shut up, Chip, or I'm going to go ape ass on your ass. Like, it was Talladega Nights. I love when people have, like, what I just did. Like, you have to censor yourself, but he kind of sort of does it. And he's like, I'm so effing mad. Um, Janine Pirro. It's it's crazy. Like, this is happening. Uh, Matt Gates's calculation, I think... It's not crazy to say that he looked at the force the vote fallout for people who were like, let's figure out a coherent strategy. And then was like, oh, but I know that if I just stick to like the most extreme version of it, at least I'll be seen as the most pure version of whatever the um alternative could be perceived as being to the to the establishment. That's the political calculus. And you watch everyone kind of in between try to position themselves rhetorically in Republican terms as at least strong. They're trying to seem strong because no matter what position you take in politics these days in a Donald Trump world, you at least get a base amount of support points if you're if you're perceived as strong. And the job of people like Matt Gates right now is to convince everyone else that unless you were one of the eight people that voted against uh, McCarthy, you're absolutely weak. And what you what you end up seeing in these situations is is just different tactics to try to explain why they did what they did. Um, I don't see anyone really clearly laying out, Matt Gates included, what the legislative agenda was on either side. The argument from McCarthy's camp is let's not embarrass ourselves, which is important. And that kind of action has the kind of stuff we're seeing did has submarined not internally in this way, but has submarined previous speakers of the House um, and people on the Republican side when they cater to like the Tea Parties um, or in this case the Freedom Caucus. But even members of the Freedom Caucus broke. You know, like yeah. it's weird. I don't know what let Matt Gates is. Call is less spending, which is not populist, and no Ukraine, America first, which is just some kind of random goalpost they set up for themselves. Um, but yeah, at the end of it, I love watching this. I think it's, and the Democrats, as we played with the Hakeem Jeffries quote earlier, uh, Hakeem is just is stating where the Democrats are now. Uh, effectively, they are the party of stability. And the other side is going to kind of try to move that into being you're the establishment. You're what we hate about politics, the the way it is. But what they have to completely distract people from is like, no, a big part of what people hate about politics is what the Republicans are doing right now by just being completely useless, fighting amongst themselves and not um, you know, portraying America as a bastion of strength, stability in, in the world. Well, and and by the way, as it's getting destroyed again, whatever fallout happens from not having a speaker and the delay that's not going to happen, the blame, as we saw from the top, Kevin McCarthy will blame his political opponents, and they hope that enough of their supporters will believe it, despite what they're seeing in front of them. And it's worked so far, so why try doing anything else now? By the way, it did remind me, Kevin McCarthy. Do you remember this, Brett? Kevin McCarthy is the last of the young guns. Remember? Yeah. I the do young remember. guns, uh, uh, Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, and uh, and and Kevin McCarthy. They've yeah. all been run the f out because the young guns were supposed to be the next wave of the new leaders of the Republican Party. And we're seeing what happens with the person who stuck around, right? Like <laughs> Paul Ryan was like, "I got my tax cuts, I got my my speakership, I am leaving." Eric Cantor couldn't hold his own turf; he lost. His yeah. own election because people are like, you're crazy. He got Madison Cawthorn. Mm-hmm. Kevin McCarthy stuck around the longest of them. Um, but he mm-hmm. too just is doing something. I wonder if it's going to be the fate of Matt Gates. Matt Gates is smarter than the rest of them. Um, he's not smarter than Paul Ryan, but he's definitely smarter than Kevin McCarthy. Um, and we'll see. I mean, he won a battle. I still don't know really what the war is. That's what people are asking, especially when it comes to Matt Gates' approach. Is it personal? Is it some action with politics? Does he actually want to change things? Who knows? But now that he's the um, the silent speaker of the House who controls the maneuvers of the entire Congress, I guess, then that's where it is. I feel like there's one of these I want like 
to read. Uh, natural born healer. Oh, I think it is. Pelosi uh, says, Pelosi, we need a strong Republican Party. McCarthy, I got this. <laughs> I remember Pelosi was saying that. But those are things that, you know, frustrated some folks, but that's how she operates. Uh, now we see where we stand. Who knows who that next uh, Speaker of the House is going to be in the mid in the meantime, but the fallout about how Kev McCarthy uh, found his ass out on the curb is just, I don't know, sometimes it's just entertaining. Uh, let's start here with the guy who did it. And when it comes to how those raise money, I take no lecture on asking patriotic Americans to weigh in and contribute to this fight from those who would grovel and bend knee for the lobbyists and special interests who own our leadership, who have, oh, boo all you want, who have hollowed out this town. Oh, boo. Uh, there's uh, Matt Gates being booed by his own fellow Republicans as he was railing as they kicked out Kevin McCarthy from his speakership. So he's the big name surrounding this. But I want to focus on a couple of the folks, the other seven, some of the other seven Republicans who voted to kick Kevin McCarthy out, one particularly Tim Burchett from Tennessee, who in my mind is known for uh, after that uh, school shooting that killed those little children. He said, we're not going to do anything about it. My kid goes to private school, so I don't give a hot damn what happens to your children. That Tim Burchett, he also voted against Kevin McCarthy. And uh, he was saying, this is the reason. Let's jump on this from the Hill. Representative Tim Burchett said a condescending comment from former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy about the lawmaker preying on the vote to remove him from office sealed his decision to support the ousting. Wow. Well, he just said something that was very condescending to me. And it doesn't really matter at this point. But at that point, I thought to myself that that pretty much sealed it right there. That's what he told reporters at the Capitol right after he cast his vote against him. So after that, it was like, well, what's going on, bro? He went on TV and talked to uh, uh, talked to Jake Tapper. Jake Tapper asked him for more uh, more details, and this is what he got. I'm sorry, but like I just find this so shocking. What exactly did he say to mock your faith, sir? It really doesn't matter. Um, uh, it was just the fact that I'd, I'd publicly stated on your station, I think this morning, that I that I was praying about it, and I was, you know, I had two paths to go: either go with my friend or go with my conscience. And I was praying that God would tell me what to do, which He does. When someone mocks me like that and mocks my religion, and honestly, the Bible is pretty clear about God being mocked. So I, I that that. That that's what sealed it right there for me. I said this is not the this is not the quality or the character of person that I want as speaker of the United States. Yeah, I can't understand that at all. I can't. It sounds like Jake Tapper said I can't understand that at all. It seems like because who understands that? That's no clear answer as far as what I can tell. What is it that he said to you that offended you so much that you then had to switch it up and say you're not going to vote for McCarthy? You were offended because he he, he 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 mocked your faith. And you know what the Bible says about people that mock it? Um, I wasn't really sure, but um, it's probably something like death. <laughs> you guys can look it up and let me know. Uh, but Kevin McCarthy was asked one more time again during that marathon press conference. He did give the details of what angered Burchett so much. This was fun. Okay, let's get through this. I, I personally like Tim Burchett, and I called Tim Burchett because I read his quote. And Tim Burchett's a friend of mine, which I'm kind of shocked by this. And Tim Burchett, in his quote, said, he's leaning towards no, he's on CNN, but I'm going to pray about it. So I pick up the phone and call him because I didn't think he was already there. I said, Tim, um, I read your quote. You said you're going to pray about it. I want to talk to you about it. And somehow he construes that I'm a Christian. I'm not going to offend somebody. From I simply read his quote back. I thought there was still an opening, and I wanted to talk to him about it. He never mentioned anything when we were communicating like that. And he said, Brett, I think I'm missing something. Because Kevin McCarthy says he heard that Tim Burchett was leaning towards, yes, kick him out. He said, so I called to see if I could talk to him about it. That offended Tim Burchett and made him vote no or vote yes. I, I'm still trying to figure it out. The offense was he interfered with his dis, his uh, his praying and his discussions with God about what to do by asking to talk to him. Okay, three things. One, that's not what happened. What Kevin McCarthy says, I just asked him a question. There's no way that's what happened. My guess is that Kevin McCarthy did snap at him at some point because he's under, get this, a little bit of stress at the time. Um, two, what pops out to me is is Kevin McCarthy saying, he's a friend of mine. I'm shocked by this. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you being shocked by stuff 
is the reason you shouldn't be Speaker of the House. No Speaker of the House should be as shocked by as many things as you are shocked by. And three, this is the biggest one. Another reason he should not be Speaker of the House. Kevin McCarthy, in losing Tim Burchett, he failed at the most basic Republican leadership duty that has been around since like Nixon, which is tricking evangelicals. Your job as an establishment Republican is to know how to talk to religious people <laughs> to convince them that even though you live in the Tower of Babel, you still are a man of God. And you failed at that, you total moron. And you are weak, you are sniveling, you are bad at this. That's why you're out on your ass. How did I end up liking Tim Burchett at the end more than I liked a guy from Bakersfield? Because he's from Bakersfield. Uh, uh, no, Bakersfield's no, got really good meth, man. <laughs> there's not, there's nothing, there's, there was there was no answer for it. Um, because Tim Burchett had mentioned debt, he mentioned deficit, he mentioned a bunch of stuff. So it could be those other things. But for some reason, in different circles and in different interviews, he says uh, all these other reasons. So I still wonder from Matt Gates to now Tim Burchett, really, what was it? And I, for some reason, I was buying what McCarthy was saying. So maybe he was lying. Who knows? Uh, I want to wrap this one more part with these with these reactions and responses to McCarthy getting kicked out with this last one. Let's go to SOT 6 here, you guys, because uh, 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 Matt Gates is back on TV again. This is, again, post right after him finally having his victory. <laughs> Because what happened to Kevin McCarthy and then the coalition of the eight Republicans that jumped in and voted him out could also happen to the new speaker. Because Matt Gates is is he's got his he's got his target set on anybody. Let's watch this. I do have to offer some pretty sharp criticism of the new pro tem of the House, Patrick McHenry. We met tonight and he sent us home until Tuesday of next week, Eric. We should be here tomorrow working to elect a new speaker, getting onto our appropriations bills and engaging in a, in a negotiation with the Senate to get the government funded. But instead, whoa, these people have got to go home and cry for a week. They've got to go do a week of hand wringing and bedwetting over the fact that Kevin McCarthy isn't speaker anymore. This institution is about more than one man. It's about the job. How about we pass a budget? So McHenry has the power of the speakership now, and literally his first act as the acting speaker of the house was to send everyone home till Tuesday. That's moving in the wrong direction. We gotta get a new speaker and we've gotta get leadership to understand a sense of urgency. Yo, once you're wielding some power, it's all over the place. Now, again, I'm sure there's many people that don't want them taking a week off. But for whatever reason that they're doing it, I'm not sure the logistics of what they then do for that week or if it actually helps with getting something done after they get back, I don't know. So I, I can't make a determinative factor of what's it that they're doing and is it helpful or not at all. But hours after, it's look at this new guy. Who's this Patrick McHenry guy? Somebody needs to do something about him. If only there was someone who could bring up one person who could bring up a motion to go ahead and vacate the speakership yet again. And there's folks that are vying for positions already. Brett, I don't want to get too deep in it because this is developing today, but we got one Jim Jordan, we got another Steve Scalise, and we got tons of other folks that are lining up ready to get into place. And Jim Jordan, just as of yesterday, as of Tuesday, said, no, nah, not interested. And as of Wednesday, uh, I saw an article that said, uh, Jim Jordan becomes the first to announce his run for speaker. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, he sure did. Uh, as of this morning, he said he's going to run to be the next speaker. Oh, wow. we'll move like to do, yeah, all these folks are going to get upset. And he said, you know, this is what he said. This is his quote before you uh, jump in, because it's going to be Steve Scalise or this guy or other folks who are talking. He says, I think I can unite the conservative base and the party and the conference. That's why I'm running. Steve because Scalise is so bad at, at being a Republican that he got shot. You know, I thought they were supposed to have a bunch of guns all the time and be able to dissuade people from shooting him. Steve Scalise failed at that. Jim Jordan. I mean, I guess, you know, Dennis Hastert was the Republican, you know, led the Republicans and he was involved in sex scandals. So I guess Jim Jordan, that that does have some kind of precedent. Um, I don't know who it's going to be. It'll probably be Scalise. Um, but uh, Matt Gates wants it. 
Matt Gates needs to remember that the Democrats do have power in this situation where they can affect the final outcome of things. So we'll see how it all comes together. Um, if Matt Gates goes up against someone who is a better negotiator than than Kevin McCarthy, then uh, I don't think they're going to make the same mistakes again. Um, but I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, I don't know who would want this job. It's one of those things. It's like when Conan wanted to host the Tonight Show, but he ended up getting in a position where he was like, where Leno just moved a half hour earlier. It's like you wanted the job so bad you didn't calculate how it would be when you had it. <laughs> um, and yeah. and and for for uh, right now to be a leader in the Republican Party is a nightmare. They are like the wildlings past the wall, and there's just no man's raider to hold them together. My big hope is that our dear friend uh, Donald Trump does get a nomin. He will get an official nomination from Matt Gates. And we'll see if they vote for him. That would be uh, absolutely hilarious. Oh, uh, they won't, that was but. mentioned, and I tried to act like I didn't see it, just so I didn't <laughs> have to think about it anymore. Feel it. Matt Gates did that last go around. He nominated Trump, and Trump was yeah. like, "Nah, it's too close to the election now." I think he also but. spoke to Trump too, though, and he said he's not going to not going to uh, relay what is they spoke about. We'll see. Uh, let's get this squeeze this woman because there's uh, there's the first order of business for the new temporary speaker here after Kevin McCarthy was kicked out. One Patrick McHenry, he's got some power now and he's wielding it. Let's talk about the first thing that he's done. So now that Kevin McCarthy's kicked out, Patrick McHenry has kicked someone else out. Let's go to this from CNN. And one of his first moves as speaker pro temp, Representative Patrick McHenry ordered former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to immediately vacate her hideaway office in the Capitol by Wednesday, that's today. While lawmakers who are not in leadership don't usually have offices in the Capitol, Pelosi, as a former speaker, was allowed to keep one. This is what it said to her. Please vacate the space tomorrow, the room will be rekeyed. Get the F out. That's what a top aide on the Republican controlled House Administration Committee wrote. The room was being reassigned by the acting speaker, quote, for speaker office use. That speaker who's going to take over that office, I assume we're talking about, is McHenry, which makes sense. I mean, for the month or so that you've got the power, however long they take to do this, you might as well get the fancy swanky office. But Pelosi wasn't very entertained by this, is what she said. With all the important decisions that that the new Republican leadership must address, which are all eager, which we are all eagerly awaiting. One of the first actions taken by the new speaker pro temp was to order me to immediately vacate my office in the Capitol. Sadly, because I'm in California to mourn the loss of and pay tribute to my dear friend, Diane Feinstein. I'm unable to retrieve my belongings at this time. She wasn't done. As speaker, I gave former speaker Hassard a significantly larger suite of offices for as long as he wished. Office space doesn't matter to me. Yes, it does, but it doesn't seem to be important to them. But it, but it seems to be important to them, is what she said. Now that new Republican leadership has settled this important matter, let's hope they get to work on what's truly important for the American people. So, as you can see, Brett, uh, the thoughts were dripping with sarcasm about how they're not doing anything and we're expecting some kind of work. And this is their first item in order of business. It was a quick picture of this that I think someone took. I saw it on Political of that office, and people were already thinking of ways, or not thinking of ways, but apparently some movement was happening. And as she pointed out, she's out of town. She's out in California for uh, for remembrance of Diane Feinstein, but immediately kicked out because apparently the offices are normally across the street, and this is some special nice office. Um, I think it's okay for her to be mad about this, and it's also okay for them to do it because that's the power of it. I wouldn't want to be kicked out of my nice office either, but. Dims the brakes, right? Listen, she, I think she played this hilariously. Um, and I'm glad it was a, uh, we're reading the statement instead of listening to uh, her say stuff like this. But <laughs> I mean, Nancy Pelosi, I mean, this, the guy who did this is wearing a bow tie when he petulantly bangs the gavel because he's so mad. It's when was the job? It is so, it's bad petty, right? There's good petty and there's bad petty. Good petty is when you do something horrible that gets to the heart of the person you don't like in a way that's just hilarious. But kicking Nancy, like when you and your role boy took a massive loss in an unprecedented ouster of your own speaker by your own party, the first move you take shouldn't be to get rid of Nancy Pelosi's office. It should be to save your own face. It was horrible. And she's just like, I I have an office. 
I'm gonna go to it. I'm glad that, and she points out how huge a waste of time. When the and the Democrats have done this time and time again. When the um, when they were voting on the shutdown, or when they when the shutdown was looming before the Democrats bailed out the entire government, what you know these guys these guys also had a freaking impeachment hearing for Joe Biden with no evidence, which was a total disaster for them. The party is in ruins. The only saving grace they have is that like. Joe Biden isn't very popular, but I wonder how that will affect race by race decisions in the upcoming election because the incumbent party typically loses seats, but the in but the um, you know a party whose president is the incumbent typically loses seats in these situations. But I don't know. Trump has been able to convince a lot of people that like I just need to get rid of the Trump element in my party on a on a, a local like uh, representative basis. That's the thought. Who knows if it's gonna work, but uh, you know, I, I guess there's other things they could do. But there was something I was trying to look at where I saw it. But apparently, they said there was some rule that was carried over or some a directive from the former speaker, now Kevin McCarthy, who pushed this for Pelosi to kick the f out. I don't know. The blame game is going around, and no one's really two answered. years later. <laughs> yeah, come or on. you know, how and, uh, like a year later after he got the job, two hundred days later. It was like, it was a trigger point. Like if I get kicked out, so does she. Let's take this next break. A few of your thoughts. I know we're over. We'll talk in a second. But when we come back, though, Donald Trump is going to his normal mobster tactics, and it's not working for him in his legal cases. If you can figure out which one it is, there's like 91 of them. We'll figure it out in a second. Donald Trump continues to poke around, threaten, and continues to get silenced, hopefully. We'll see, because in this latest case, a gag order has been put forward by Judge Arthur Ngoron. He's overseeing the New York fraud trial with Donald Trump. And he issued this gag order on Trump after he had he posted a truth social post that the judge thought was a little bit out of line. In fact, it was very out of line. We'll see in a second, but first let's go to the what is that happened and what is that this judge said. So this morning, one of the defendants posted on a social media account a disparaging, untrue, and personally identifying post about a member of my staff. Although I have since ordered the post deleted, and apparently it was, it was also emailed out to millions of other recipients. Personal attacks of any member of my court staff are unacceptable, inappropriate, and I will not tolerate them. That's Judge Arthur and Goran. The if you guys have been seeing, I think some of the anger surrounding him. He's the, excuse me. He's the judge who, when the cameras are in the courtroom, did you see this, Brett? When the cameras are in the yeah. courtroom, he didn't know what to do. I'm not sure who held that camera. If he was surprised by it, but it came to his face, and he was like, "Oh, let me take my glasses off." So that was <laughs> it was a bit of a problem, but still now he's serious and he's very upset more. Consider this statement in order forbidding all parties from posting, emailing, or speaking publicly about any members of my staff is what he said. Failure to abide by this will result in serious sanctions. I'm not sure what sanctions he's looking to put forward on him. He's not going to put him in jail or anything or whatever it is that they can do from this position. But he's hoping these threats will work. I think others have talked about this, and I'm not sure how much Trump has followed it. But here's that post that's got Ngoron's uh, dander up. First, it was uh, put up forward by this group called Judicial Protest. And there's a picture of uh, uh, Chuck Schumer and this clerk. He said, why is Judge Ngoron's principal law clerk palling around with Chuck Schumer? Which Donald Trump jumped right on, reposted and retruthed. And said, Schumer's girlfriend is running this case against me. How disgraceful. This case should be dismissed immediately. What does that mean? So you identify someone, say that they're his girlfriend falsely, and then say she's running this case against me. So is the point that no one should be running a case against you? Which, by the way, she's not because he's lying, obviously. She's not running the case. Principal law clerks to judges are responsible for researching and analyzing uniquely intricate, complex, and sensitive legal issues and questions for individual judges. They also provide other personal and confidential assistance to an individual judge or judges. He since deleted that post because is basically showing who she was so people can find out who she is and not, if not just harass her online, potentially in person. So he did do that. But still, this is the process. This is the approach he's got when it comes to folks. And I did read something else, Brett, that this particular clerk, this uh, Allison Green, uh, sorry, Greenfield is her name. Um, she apparently is good at intercepting and shutting down all of the delay and BS tactics that Donald Trump's attorneys are looking to push in all, in this case. And she's really good at it. That's why she's running the case against me. 
because she's just, she's uh she's shutting him down at every turn. That's what's got him angry. Well, yeah, clerks. It's an interesting relationship with clerks. If you clerk for a judge, you are in a great position to do other stuff in your career. There are you know people on the Supreme Court who are only on the radar of the party because they clerked for uh, previous and you know now sitting members of the Supreme Court. So that's. Clerks do a lot. It's a very involved uh, process. You're writing the opinions generally, but it is based theoretically on the on the direction of of the judge themselves. Um, but if you want to play this game, Trump, where we're like, oh, here's a picture of someone who's affiliated with a scandal and someone in power. I have a game we can play because here's a photo of you and Epstein. Be like, what is he doing with Epstein? <laughs> like, we can play this game. All you want. Um, it is harassment. Trump has made so many mistakes and done so many shady things in this situation. He's like, he there's there's an amazing documentary everybody needs to watch on it's on Max and it's called uh BS High about like a lot of people who are con men do so in a way that's like below the radar. But there are some people like the guy in this documentary and Donald Trump who who just find themselves so drawn to the spotlight. That their BS that they would have otherwise get a, gotten away with by just kind of being over in a in a, in a in a in another sector of everyone's mind. Once they get, once Trump becomes president, everyone's like, "Well, you can't do that stuff. You can't blatantly do that stuff and expect us to let you get away with it." Because at that point, it makes it, it makes you seem strong and me seem weak, even though I have the law on my side. All the judge is doing is applying the law. And Trump himself made such a huge mistake by going forward with checking a box on a, or allegedly checking a box saying he didn't want a jury trial. So he put all the power in this judge's hands and now he's just crapping on the judge the whole time. That's not a good strategy. Alina Haba was trying to explain uh, their lack of asking for that jury trial. And when Trump was complaining about it, I think he spoke for like five, seven minutes before he went in one day. And then when he came out, he was still talking just in the courtroom area. Like, it's a shame I have to be here. And I'm not sure if he had to be there, but he decided to be there because this is what's politically expedient for him. It's all he's got left is to try and adjudicate this publicly so that it contain enough people's minds that whatever it is that does happen, because he might be throwing in the towel here because it sounds like this evidence is piled up and it's pretty damning on him. One thing left is after it happens, for then whatever judgment comes forward, for him to then say, you see how unfair it was? The entire time I've been fighting this, I've told you guys a litany of lies. And therefore, you believe this alternate reality. So when real reality shows up, you can be mad about it. This is his entire basis for anything that he does. So this is just another opportunity to set that stage. If it comes with uh, threatening Allison uh, and or the work that she's actually doing, so be it. He doesn't care. He goes after his friends this way. You think he's not going to go after people who are actually trying to do their jobs? This is how he operates. It's a disaster. Uh, one of the parts, though, because the way he uh, does like to do this thing is they're pu also pushing that the election has already been stolen. Again, this is all about politics. He knows he's probably gonna lose when it comes to the actual details of the case really fast because the Trump campaign put out this whole statement saying that senior advisors Susie Wiles and Chris La Civita, Civitica? Civita, La Civita if it's Italian. It's a lovely Italian name, I assume. Uh, and they say the RNC should immediately cancel this upcoming debate in Miami and end all future debates in order to refocus its manpower and money on preventing Democrats efforts to steal the election, the one that isn't anywhere near right now. One where he's fighting uh, with Republicans, not really fighting, but competing somewhat with Republicans in the primary uh, just to get uh, this point, uh, just the point of the nomination. The only thing that's stopping him right now are these cases. That's why they're bringing it up. He's like, if we can just eliminate that part, I can focus strictly on saying that the Democrats are trying to steal the election. So can we get by all this? Yeah, his- is his... good for him. Yeah, his whole argument is don't do the thing that hurts me. Instead, do the thing that helps me for reasons that don't really apply. Like there's no reason that we that like these aren't the same elements at play that are going after you um and are some and he's it's a fake problem. His whole job, he's like uh, when the sumo wrestlers just kind of do this to get you a bunch of the thousand hand slap <laughs> to kind of get you off balance. That's Trump's whole thing. He's like, just hit them on everything, everywhere, all at once until they just like maybe lose focus on the thing they're doing. It's not going to work. Everybody has like, this is literally the judge's job 
the RNC is going to do what they can anyway without, you know, embarrassing themselves too much. Trump just his job is to just, you know, kick up dust and, and try to push people off off balance. Still working on it. Uh, let's work on this break, you guys. As we go off to the aftermath, don't forget, if you guys want to hang out a little bit longer, you can go to tyt.com uh, slash damage report slash join. I'm sorry, this is youtube.com slash damage report slash join. No one give you the wrong information because you're going to show up. But before you do that, grab tightly on those ass cheeks. We'll be back in a few minutes to talk to you. That's <laughs> fun things. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.